Hey, welcome to the All In Podcast. I am joined by Liam Donnelly. He is a Canadian pro triathlete and student. How are you managing all that, especially during you know COVID times right now? Yeah, it's definitely not easy. Um, it, it's a lot of work, a lot of hours, and you really have to be careful with your time and you got to protect your time when you can um, and, and plan out your weeks and your days in advance. But um, if you want to get everything done, you certainly can if you put in the effort. Right. It's kind of like, you know, what are your priorities there? It's like you can play video games or you could train to be a triathlete. <laughs> yeah, they, they always say you make time for the things you love. And I love triathlon. I also am really passionate about uh, school and the academics that I'm in. So, I mean, it's not hard for me to, to wake up in the day and get excited about training or, or even class. Um, although it is a lot of work, I enjoy both of the things. So um, it's a lot easier for me to stay motivated to, to do them every day. Mm, that's awesome. I, I think it's rare for an athlete to really be motivated to go to school. But when I was like researching your background, I think what's even more rare is that you went from mathematics to business school. Yeah. So the way my program works, um, so I'm at the Ivy Business School at Western University and business school actually starts in the third year of university. And you're okay. able to do any program you want for the first two years. So <laughs> I, I think... I don't know how many people did math, but uh, when I was deciding which universities I wanted to go for, um, I was choosing between either studying math or business and at Western, I could do both. So I'm still undecided if I'm going to ever finish my math degree, but but yeah, I enjoyed the more quantitative side and (laughs) it's a bit (laughs) different now in business school, but, uh, but yeah, I I really like math. Wow. Uh, yeah, that is, that is rare because when I was in like marketing classes, I remember, so before I did all my university online. I tried to take a couple semesters in person and then it just didn't work out like with my snowboard schedule. But uh, I remember I was in a class because I would always miss one semester. So I was in like a a marketing class that was like a year behind. So it was all people who failed marketing and it was entirely accountants, like everyone who loves numbers, but they, they just did not like marketing. And the girl sat beside me and she told me she was working at Money Mart or something and doing a lot of math. And she's like, it doesn't feel like work. It's just so fun. I'm like, oh my gosh, we are totally different people. <laughs> and yeah, like the, the math in business school is so different from the math I was doing before. Like in, in the pure math side, it's so rigorous with proofs and theorems and all that. And in business school, it's, oh, you make an assumption and you move on. And <laughs> I'm like, this is it. But, uh, but yeah, I think like it's a skill set that when I do go into the workforce, uh, I'll be happy that I had that more rigorous quantitative side. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially if you wanted to do something like in economics or something like that. Is what, What's your plan with that? What do you, what's your goals with, with that side, the academic side and like work other than, you know, triathlete stuff? Because I'm sure we're, we're going to dive into that further. Yeah, so this was actually a big decision um, that I had to make. So coming out of business school, you know, there's a lot of pressure for all of us to immediately work full time at either a bank or a consulting firm or marketing firm, something like that. And really it's all anyone talks about uh, at school. It's, oh, where are you recruiting for? You know, did you get a job yet? And for me, I, I kind of had to make the decision of if I was going to go down that route or pursue triathlon full time. And really w- with the way triathlon is, it would be impossible for me to do both full time just because there's so much training involved and in traveling to races and all that. And so, yeah, it was, it was a big decision for me to say, okay, I'm going to give myself some time after university to pursue triathlon full time to, to follow my dream. Because, you know, once I step away from that, I'm never going to have another opportunity. And I did talk with, uh, I, I kind of just searched on LinkedIn for a bunch of people that had been pro triathletes and then, you know, went into the workforce a bit later in life and connected with them, had a few chats with them. And, they all kind of told me, yeah, you're making the right decision. You need to see this through. And they, they all even regretted that they didn't stay in triathlon even longer. Um, wow. they, they said, you've got your whole life to work. It's not going anywhere. But, um, but if triathlon truly is something that matters to you, then you need to see it through. So my plan right now is to, to go for it pretty much and at least hopefully see it through the next Olympic cycle and kind of reevaluate as I go. Um, When I'm graduating, obviously I'll have this degree in my back pocket. So 
I have something to fall back on if triathlon doesn't work out, but I'm not really thinking that way. I, I want to see triathlon through all the way and then make the transition later on. That's so cool that you reached out to these other triathletes who had done something similar. And I think that's a lesson for anyone listening. Like if you are trying to make some sort of decision with your life, like whether it's quit your job and build a business or it's to go all in on your sport career, there are people who have done it that you can reach out to now. And social media has made it so easy. And especially with the pandemic, some of those people are more accessible than you think. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I had all these questions and all these concerns and so much uncertainty. And I thought, I can't be the only person that's gone through this before. There has to be other people that have gone through it. And even if maybe they made mistakes, I can at least learn from their mistakes and I don't have to make them myself. And, and the triathlon community is super close knit. So all of them were really happy to, to talk to me and to kind of share their story. And yeah, I think it's definitely a lesson for all athletes, you know, use, use the people in your sport that have done the things you want to do and learn from them because you know, like you said, it's so easy right now. People, everyone is familiar with Zoom or Skype or whatever, and you can just hop on a call with them and they're happy to share their story and they've succeeded in the things you want to succeed in. So why wouldn't we try to learn from them? Yeah. Yeah. Such an important lesson. Now I know like with, with endurance sports, you usually peak a little bit later in life than say like in my sport with snowboarding, there's like 14 year olds doing crazy things, um, and different sports where you might peak at like 20, were you ever thinking about not going to university and like just doing triathlon then? Yeah. So actually I'm, I'm probably the exception in my sport. Um, of doing university full-time. I took a full course load all the way through graduating in four years. And I honestly don't know if I can name a single pro athlete, but I know that either didn't go to school or that went to school and didn't take a reduced course load. Uh, a lot of people will either not go at all or they'll do a semester on a semester off, or they'll take three courses a semester. And it's because the, the training requirements for triathlon are so large. So it, it was definitely a, a bit of pressure. And I would say I kind of sometimes felt jealous of my competitors that were doing that. But I, I always knew that, um, you know, the academic side is something that I've always uh, been, been pretty passionate about. And it was never really something that I considered to, to wait. Um, and because the way my program is, I couldn't take a reduced course load even if I wanted to. <laughs> so, so, uh, so that made that choice pretty easy. But yeah, it, it is it is tough seeing, you know, some of your competitors delaying their school and thinking maybe if I did that, I could be a little farther along in sport, but I know that looking back, I think I'll be happy that I, I did the, the path that I took. Yeah. Oh, I think that's such an important lesson. You know, my, my story was similar. I was snowboarding. I got onto the junior national team at 17. So I was like, I don't want to go to school. I just want to snowboard. And my parents were like, you know, we're making a deal here. Like you gotta, you gotta go to school. And so I was the only one. Um, and anywhere I went, like everyone's, you know, a pro snowboarder, that's all they do. And they have zero interest in school at all. And so having to chip away, it took me eight years, I think, to get my degree because I had to just do it. But I, I, I wasn't able to, go to school just because of the travel. I think that's one of the cool things about, you know, a sport like triathlon is you can kind of train wherever you are. Obviously in Canada, it's a little bit harder in the, in the winter time. Um, but how, how are you dealing with that during um, COVID times? Cause I've heard from a few athletes that they're pretty jealous of some of these other countries that might be more open or they can train, you know, all season because they can travel. Or I have a friend who's a um, track and field Olympian, she said that the team Canada won't let them go to Phoenix for a training camp. Uh, but then she can't train like out in the winter really. So she's falling behind when she's trying to qualify. Have you experienced any of those things? Yeah. Um, I mean, COVID has brought a few challenges with, uh, kind of access to training facilities for me. So when it all started, uh, the pools obviously closed and it was still too cold to swim open water like last March. So, yeah. uh, I was two and a half months without swimming, which for me, swimming is my weakest of three sports. So that was a big setback for me physically, but also emotionally, you know, I, I was kind of losing all of my confidence thinking that it's going to take me maybe over a year to get back to the swim fitness that I was. Um, and then the summer rolled around, it was a little easier. Um, just a lot of solo training, which is a little more difficult, but had access to all the training I needed to. And then kind of with this second wave back in the winter, it's become a little more challenging, but 
I was really fortunate in this last lockdown, um, the city of London and the London Aquatic Club, London Aquatic Club uh, allowed me to swim um, in their facility uh, with, with a few other swimmers that were training for Olympic trials. So I've been super fortunate to have access to a pool, which um, really not a lot of other triathletes in Canada um, have been that lucky. And then obviously with running, you're kind of at the mercy of the winter <laughs> right now. And uh. normally, normally this would be indoor track season for me. I, I run for Western university. So, um, it's been tough kind of being at the mercy of the snow. And if the snow plows are coming through on the sidewalks and stuff like that, <laughs> um, and, and then riding in the winter in Canada, I'm always just on the indoor trainer. So that hasn't been any change for me. I've just pretty much riding in my house. Um, yeah, just lots of Netflix and YouTube when you're doing that. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, I've been pretty lucky with the, the access to the facilities, but it definitely has been challenging, um, but still grateful that I've been able to do at least some training, probably 90% of the, the regular training I've been doing. So, so yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, I find like a lot of athletes that I've talked to, they've lost some motivation, especially when some of those changes happen. How have you stayed motivated and furthering along on that question? I know endurance sports are just so mental. I've tried, like, I am like, uh, I like to do short, quick type sports and I've been trying to, um, like sit on my, my, uh, bike for like an hour inside. I'm like, no, I want to go outside. I can't like focus. So how do you stay motivated and how do you train mentally for, for your sport? Yeah. So, so on the motivation piece, um, I've always been super long-term oriented, uh, with my career in sports. So I think it actually goes back to when I started, um, I was okay at running and riding, but I had zero swim background. And because of that, I was felt like I was always playing catch up and it was kind of, okay, I'm improving, but I know I'm not where I'm going to be in the future yet. And kind of that, that hope that, you know, I was, going to be better next year and better the next year kind of has shaped the way I think about my career now. And even as a 21 year old, I'm really thinking about four years down the line, eight years down the line, when I'm going to be on my peak. And, you know, this is just kind of uh, where I am in my career now, but it's not the only thing that matters. So I think having that long-term focus has really helped my, with my motivation training. I only did one race in 2020 and a lot of people, um, racing is the only thing that gets them through the training sessions. And for me, it was like, well, I'm going to, I know I'm going to be racing in four years. So, I mean, I'm going to be putting in this work regardless. And, and so really it didn't, it didn't affect me as much as maybe some other people who are either at the end of their career or really aren't as long-term focused. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, that, that has helped me a lot because, you know, I really haven't felt uh, like if I don't race, I'm quitting the sport or something like that, because I've, I enjoy the training uh, and I know that it's going to pay off even if not in 2020 or 2021, um, it will at some point down the line. Yeah, that that's so important. I think it's I think it's easy to get caught up as a, a young athlete or a young entrepreneur. Like I want things to work now. I want to be the best now. But having that long term vision and just being like, this is where I'm at. I'm focusing on the process. How do I get better every day so that four eight years down the line, I'm going to catch those people who didn't go to school or whatever it is. I think is just you know so 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 important. Is there was there a switch where that happened, or have you always had that like all your life, just that long term focus? Uh, I think I've always had it in some parts. And I think that once it, I got a little bit of a taste of success in, uh, in like some races that I was doing, it actually kind of reaffirmed that because I, I would, for example, the first time I ever won provincials, it wasn't like, oh my gosh, I'm provincial champion. It's like, wow, maybe now I can compete at nationals. Then once you do well at nationals, it's like, okay, maybe I can make the world championship team. And so in my career, I've always been kind of seeing every result as like a jumping point to the next one. And so I wouldn't say it was a switch. It kind of just reaffirmed that this is kind of how I'm hardwired as an athlete. And maybe that means I won't ever be truly satisfied until I'm at the highest level and there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I, I think that 
it's helped me in the sense that I've never become complacent with my results. Um, and, and yeah. Yeah. Always striving for, for that next level. Have you, how have you found that transition from the next level? Cause I know in, in my experience, like you go from winning provincials or winning some of these events, and then all of a sudden you go to others fighting for like a top 50, a top 30 in these other events. How has that transition been mentally? Yeah. So I found it, it was less so, uh, so in my junior career, I, I made the transition pretty well from domestic to international racing. And I had some strong international results as a junior. And then I made the transition to senior racing. And that's when I really saw that gap. I I was like, wow, these, I am still a boy racing against men here. (laughs) And the, the difference in fitness was pretty apparent. And, uh, and yeah, it was tough. So I wasn't training nearly as much as my competitors were. And that was kind of intentional, but also it was kind of a sign that I needed to take that next step. So over the past three years, I would say, uh, I've been slowly building up the volume in my training to a point now that is (laughs) unfathomable three years ago for me. And, you know, I, my biggest week ever three years ago would be like a laughable week now, um, of training. So, so yeah, it, it was a bit of a shock. My first race ever, I, <laughs> I had just gotten a uh, top five at the junior Pan Am championships. And, uh, and then I made my elite debut like a few weeks later and I got 35th or something like <laughs> yeah. that. And I was like, I, I, I was riding that high from, from Pan Ams and I was like, wow, I'm, I'm next up. Like, this is amazing. And then I just got absolutely slapped and <laughs> it, was, it was a big wake up call because I was getting beat by guys who I thought I shouldn't have gotten beat by. And I realized, okay, it's a different style of racing. I, I need to do something different. I still have a lot of work to go. So, so going back to that mindset of long-term, I was like, okay, uh, I know that if I can give myself a few years of consistent work, then eventually I'll work up to that level, but it's, it's time to get to work now. That's awesome. Yeah. I relate with that so hard. Uh, you know, competing at like junior world championships and really having a chance to win. And then you go to these world cup events and you're competing against all the best riders who are 10 years older than you. And it's like, okay, like a top 30 would be good. And you're like a top 30, like, no, I want to win. And it's like, well, there's no chance. <laughs> and it's just, you're like in a whole different, different game. These people have a decade of more training on you. And it's, it's just so hard to, you know, figure out that long-term process. So kudos to you for still sticking with that long-term process and the long-term mindset, despite like just, you know, getting defeated. Cause it's, it's hard. Like I've been there and it's really hard. Yeah, and like you said earlier, with, with endurance sports, you do peak a lot later. And, you know, I, I know that if I stick with triathlon, my peak years will be late 20s, early 30s. And then if I ever go up into like the Ironman or half Ironman distance, then it could be mid to even late 30s. So, uh, so, so staying patient is really important in the sport. And it's tough when you're, especially when you're making this jump to doing it full time and you know that maybe you can't compete with the guys who are a little older than you. Um, but yeah, I, I think just trusting that process and knowing that if you stay consistent in your training, then eventually you'll keep leveling up to, to where you need to be. Yeah, that's awesome. So I, I saw a LinkedIn post of yours about how triathlon training takes like five to seven hours of your day. Plus you have full-time university. And I think for people who don't understand that demand, uh, like that's, that's really, really hard. Um, could you walk through like what your average day in, in your life is when you're managing those things? Yeah, for sure. So I guess it'll just be easiest if I maybe go through like the last few days uh, of training and what they looked for looked like for me. So yesterday I woke up and I had a 18 kilometer run workout, um, which was one of my quality run workouts of the week. So I was doing some hill sprints and then some tempo work at, for some context. I think I did a 5k and around 1550. That's kind of my tempo pace. So for any of you out there who are looking for some That's numbers, there it is. That's my impossible pace. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then I had uh, a meeting with school. Um, I'm on reading weeks, so obviously I don't have any class, but we still have some group projects going on. Then it was off to the pool for a two-hour swim, which was about six and a half k. Um, 
then it was heading back, did some more schoolwork, got some dinner, and then it was a two hour ride. So right there was about five and a half hours of training plus, you know, getting to and from the pools another hour almost uh, and, uh, and then schoolwork. And it's a lot. It's most days are at least, you know, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. of commitments and, and balancing that has definitely been something that I've had to adjust to, especially as I'm training more and more. I didn't used to have this many sessions a day. Um, and so kind of learning how to, how to balance it with school and making every minute of your day count can, it could seem exhausting and sometimes it is, but, um, but like I said, in that post kind of shifting your mindset to a mindset of gratitude and, you know, knowing that it's actually, you get, I got three opportunities that day to work on my craft and I got to learn new things, uh, from my classmates and, you know, I got to live a full day of life. Um, and, and when you compare it to the alternative of sitting around all day and being bored and having nothing to do, I think that's a lot more stressful than, uh, than, you know, doing things that you're passionate about all day. I love that. I, I think one of the greatest shifts in my, my, my mindset was when it was instead of ever saying you have to do this, you get to do this. And when you can look at that as just like an opportunity to get better, then you're not going to be so frustrated. If, if things go wrong, you're going to look at every opportunity and those sacrifices you make and be grateful for them. I think that's an awesome mindset to have. Yeah, I completely agree that uh, I have to versus I get to. And it's tough because, you know, sometimes when you're exhausted and you don't feel like doing that third session of the day, it does feel like a bit of a burden. But yeah. um, making at least the effort to, to realize that you're lucky to do this um, I, I've found it has made a big difference for me. Yeah. And do you ever feel like, uh, do you ever get like pressure from your classmates and people who are like, just take it easy, come hang out, like be social. Do you experience some of that stuff? Um, I wouldn't say pressure, although to, if I'm being completely honest, I used to get really jealous of my classmates who didn't have, uh, all of the things going on that I did. And, you know, I, last year when we were in in-person class, I would have class at 8 a.m. every day and I'd normally swim for two hours before that class. So I was up at, you know, 5.30 in the morning getting into a cold pool, swimming for two hours and then going to class. And then you get to class and you see your classmates saying, oh, I'm so tired, I'm so stressed. Uh, and I used to get angry. I used to be yeah. like, well, you, you don't understand, you can't relate. And then I, and then... I realized when they would ask me about like my day and my training and they would say, wow, that's so cool that you get to do that. I'm like, I'm, I'm not the one that should be jealous here. I'm the one getting up every morning and chasing my dreams. If anyone should be jealous, it's the people that don't have that passion in their life, don't have those things that they're chasing. And so realizing that it wasn't a disadvantage, it was actually a privilege um, has been like really uh, key for me and like my mental health and staying grounded and not getting overwhelmed. Yeah, I love the quote, pressure is a privilege. And uh, I think it's so true. And it's it's true. I, I believe like the world is a better place when people wake up and they have something they're passionate for and they work towards it because they're not going to be negative and judgmental to other people. They have this goal and this thing that they're working for that, you know, fuels them to get up in the morning and they're not feeling dissatisfied. Like, oh, I'm always tired. I'm stressed from this. Oh, video games are so hard. Like, you know, just shifting that mindset and having that. So I, I hope that everyone can kind of find that thing that wakes them up at five in the morning to uh, work at. And, and I will say too, um, you can't put too much pressure on yourself to always be perfect with this mindset because, you know, there are days that, you know, it's, you're just going to be exhausted and that's kind of just part of the ebbs and flows of your life and your mood. And like, I am doing physically exhausting training. It's okay to feel tired and not feel super amped to go to class um, all the time, but at least making the effort, um, I think, I think it's good, but putting the pressure can also become toxic. If you kind of start blaming yourself, if you catch yourself feeling like overwhelmed or stressed, like that's part of life. Um, but at least doing the best you can, I think is all we can ask. 
Right. Like, uh, it's been a conversation that I've been having a lot lately is that even the top athletes like LeBron James, he's not always motivated to spend all his time working and in the gym, right? Like motivation is short term, but he has that discipline where even when he doesn't feel like it, he's going to go and, you know, motivation will flux and, and flow uh, within that. Yeah. And my coach says, uh, good athletes train when it's easy, great athletes train when it's not. And it's kind of like that, um, it's obviously easy to train well when you're feeling great and you're having a good session, but, but it's the times where maybe you're not feeling too good and you still find a way to get it done that are really going to define you as an athlete. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And you know, that's the way that you can get ahead on your, on your competition because if all, all your competition, you know, you have to take into consideration, they're probably all training really great on, on their good days, but it's like, how do you treat your bad days? And if they're treating their bad days in a different way than you are, like, that's a, a great leg up that you can have. Yeah, exactly. So do you do, uh, like, I, I've always been curious about this with endurance athletes, how much strength training do you do and how do you work that in? <sighs> Yeah, so this is actually a big topic of debate uh, within even the triathlon community. Different coaches have different philosophies. That's what um, I've seen, yeah. Different athletes uh, prefer different things. And I'm definitely on the end of do not like strength training and do not do much of it. Um, we are opposites. Uh, I stay away from <laughs> endurance training. <laughs> uh, I, I guess my mindset and I, my coach shares a lot of this as well is that we are already training to the limits that our body can handle. We are doing as much training as we can with, without getting injured or sick or burnt out. Yeah. Um, and we are really at risk if we do too much pure gym work, um, especially because I don't have a background in it. My technique is definitely not perfect. So what we do instead of traditional gym and strength work is we do a lot more functional and mobility uh, movements. So uh, pretty much all of my strength training is either body weight or with like resistance cords and bands, and I don't lift any weights. Um, and pretty much the goal is not to get strong. It's just to uh, become more resilient and stay healthy and prevent injuries. So so I know some coaches and some athletes in endurance sport do lift and it has, they have a place for that in their program In our program, it doesn't really make sense for us to do that. So it's more just preventative movements and stuff like that. Mm, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And it's, it, I see videos of like runners doing power cleans and I'm like, Oh no, 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 <laughs> please don't. <laughs> and it's so funny. And, and it always blows my mind because I'm like, well, I know like, you know, we had strength and conditioning coaches that we work with. So I'm like, they would have been taught, you know, how to do this, but I haven't realized that, especially probably in the younger ages, they never had to, to do any of that. So they haven't built up like all the proper mechanics to, to actually do it. And because it's not such a staple in their programming versus for me, like Olympic lifting was a huge part of my program. So I had to work on like the actual form and the mobility with the elbows and everything. So uh, I, I, now I, I will have respect, more respect when I watch the videos because sometimes I'm like, what, what is happening? Who are their coaches? Can I talk to them? <laughs> And, uh, and there's actually also another piece to this with triathlon is that, um, there, there is no like ideal body type, I would say in triathlon. And, okay. and you look at the, in the individual sports, man, you can look at three different people and you can tell which one is a swimmer, which one is a cyclist and which one is a runner. They all have very distinct bodies and very oh, different yeah. bodies. And so maybe doing some strength work would help your swimming, but it might actually have a negative effect on your running. And, and with cycling power to weight ratio, like Watts per kilogram is the big measurement of, of fitness. And so any muscle that you're putting on for swimming is also having a detriment to your cycling and maybe your running. So finding that balance is a whole nother part of triathlon that, um, that I think gym and strength work kind of complicates as well. Yeah, right. Because for those individual sports, they might do some some lifting, but you kind of get a little bit of crossover and you have to take some sacrifices from each of those to make sure that you're good at all of those. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, when how do you split up your training between each? Like what's the percentage that goes to running, swimming and uh, and biking? Yeah. So we set up our training program on 
uh, a weekly basis. So kind of we cycle through on like on a seven day schedule. So every week kind of has the same structure. Um, so in a, in an individual sport basis, I'm swimming around 20 to 25 K a week. Um, this would be about six sessions, about an hour and a half per session. So about nine hours of swimming a week. Um, and the mix of sessions would be, um, speed, speed work. So this could be anywhere from like race pace or faster or strength work or technique work or just recovery. Um, and, and each session will have a specific focus into one of these buckets. And then with cycling, I'm riding around 300 to 400 kilometers a week. So about, uh, 10 to 14 hours maybe. Um, and with cycling, we have two key sessions a week. Um, these are usually above our threshold power. So, um, for me, my threshold's around 340 Watts, if there's any cyclists or triathletes out there. So a lot of my work will be done above this. And then the rest is just easy, like 120 heart rate, um, just kind of getting the mileage in the legs. And then with running, um, I run about 90 to 115 kilometers a week. So this would be about six to nine runs a week. Um, and similar to riding, there's two key sessions a week. These are my workouts. Um, these are like intervals, tempo or hills, something like that. And then, uh, and then a long run every week, which will be about, uh, an hour 45, um, about 26 K and then the rest is just easy running. So individually, it running is seems not like easy a lot. <laughs> Yeah. So it's all relative for me. It's kind of, I I have like a heart rate limit that I don't go over and I kind of know what it feels like. It's very conversational pace for me. Um, it's not easy. Like I still am a little tired when I get back, but it's, it's not taking the toll on my body as a a key session would or a long run would. And so (laughs) total, that would be, um, probably around 25 hours a week of actual activity. Um, and, and yeah, about 20, 20 sessions or more, uh, in a week. So, so yeah, it's, it's pretty much two, two to four workouts a day, um, which every day for 50 weeks of the year is, uh, (laughs) it is a lot. We get, I get, uh, like a complete off day, no training about once a month. Um, and, and yeah, so that's what it takes. Uh, triathlon, the way triathlon is heading, people are so fast now and you need to almost be world-class and swimming, biking and running. Um, gone are the days where you can be a good swimmer and win a triathlon or be a good runner, but not be able to swim. Uh, you need to be very proficient in all three sports and their training has to reflect that. Wow. So how do you recover like daily between sessions as well as just like weekly? Are there any tools you use ice baths, um, breath work, things like that? Yeah. So I guess in the training, um, we have like some days that are easier than others and the, the easy days are still around (laughs) like four hours of training, but, um, there's no like hard, hard intervals or anything like that. Like it's all aerobic work. So that lets the body recover a bit. So for example, on Mondays and Thursdays, I don't have any like hard activity at all. All the training that I do is just easy. And then beyond that, um, I don't have access to it right now because of COVID, but uh, normally seeing a physiotherapist once a week uh, for some soft tissue work. And then, uh, and then beyond that, it's just eating a lot of food, getting (laughs) enough sleep. Um, I'm not huge into any of the kind of fads of recovery. (laughs) Uh, I just kind of try to try to live like a very healthy lifestyle because if I'm being honest, pro athletes are training at an almost toxic level of training. Like the training I'm doing is not good for my body. Like I, (laughs) this is not. Uh, I don't recommend anyone doing this. Who's trying to live a healthy life. Uh, this is for performance. So at least I can try to be healthy in my diet, um, and in my sleep and drinking lots of water, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. There's like the health fitness continuum. Right. And it's like, here is like, you know, sedentary, like not healthy at all. And here is like, 
peak performance and in the middle is like healthy longevity, you know? And uh, yeah, I, I totally relate to that. Like I've, I've competed around the world in CrossFit. And so that's like a train, like it's very easy to overtrain as well. Although I will say we usually take one full day a week, not, not a month. So I think you're training a lot more than I ever did, but um, but yeah, you, you get to that other side, right. And you're constantly dealing with soreness, inflammation. Like there's all these things that if you were just trying to be healthy in your life, like you wouldn't train that much. Um, it's not, it's not going to increase your lifespan. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of ironic. Cause I, I struggle to get up the stairs and anytime I walk upstairs, I, I'm almost out of breath and I'm, <laughs> I feel my, you. my quads are on fire. <laughs> I'm like, I am a world-class athlete here. How is this happening? And it's, well, it's like, yeah, I guess I did just like smash myself for four hours this morning. It does kind of make sense, but it, yeah, it's just funny to think about. Oh uh, yeah. I, I totally relate. It's so funny. I used to be like, uh, we go to Colorado, be high altitude and I couldn't walk up my stairs. I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm dying here. And then in the summer, my, my dad, we'd go up to the cottage. He'd be like, okay, come help me with manual labor. I'm like, I'm so sore from training. Like, it's like, don't you train to be better at these things in life? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and my parents always say I'm the slowest, fast person they know. So I'm really <laughs> fast at swimming, biking, and running, but anything else in life, I am incredibly slow at. So, <laughs> so I can confirm that fitness is not transferable to other things in life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you go past that that continuum scale, it's it's you're going to specialize, right? At just those things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That makes sense. So what, with your nutrition, what do you do and, uh, past your nutrition as well? Like what are those like healthy lifestyle stuff you do with your sleep as well? Yeah. So, um, I guess I should start by saying I'm a vegan. So this okay. is, um, this is less driven by performance. I would say, although I definitely think that it doesn't hurt. Um, for me, it was more an ethical and environmental decision. Um, and, and so with that, I need to adjust my diet um, a little bit compared to what someone who is eating meat or meat products would be doing. So people always ask about protein on a vegan diet, and it's not as hard as they think. It's a complete myth, but um, <laughs> but it is hard to get you know the volume of protein in a single serving that you would in some meat. So for me, it's uh, a lot more important for me to just frequently be eating. So right. uh, I don't measure my my calories per, on a daily basis, but every so often I will just to check in and make sure that I'm eating enough. And, um, on a big training day, I'm eating around five to 6,000 calories, um, which wow. is, is a lot of food. Um, <laughs> especially like vegan food. I find like that would be a lot of food. Like when you look at it laid out on the table, I'm sure it looks like a lot. Yeah. So, so I guess the specifics of that, um, I'm eating, you know, four or five meals, I guess. I still eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but then in between, I'll also eat kind of what would be considered a meal for most people, um, whether that's like a, a smoothie or something like that. Um, but yeah, a lot of my protein is through nuts and seeds, um, including like peanut butter and stuff like that. And then also people really don't realize how much protein there is in stuff like steel cut oatmeal or rice and mm. spaghetti and stuff like that. So, um, I make sure that I'm getting, you know, at least hundred grams of protein a day. And it's not as difficult as you might think if you're eating like beans and rice or something like that, um, you can easily get, you know, over 20 grams of protein in a meal. So, so yeah, it, it is a lot of food and like I have to constantly eat. And for me, this, the challenge is kind of eating past the point that I'm full. Um, a lot of the times I, I know the portion I need to make and I get three quarters of the way through it. I'm like, I would be totally content to stop eating right now, but you know, I need to do this because I need to get ready for my next session and for tomorrow and stuff like that. Um, so I, w I would say that's, that's a very first world problem of having to eat a lot of food. Um, but it is, yeah, it is challenging sometimes. And, and then on the part about sleep, um, I love my sleep. I try to get as much as I can. Um, I go to bed decently early around, well, for a university student, at least <laughs> like try to be in bed at, you know, like 10 or 11 and then kind of sleeping in as late as I can until I need to do my first session of the day or my, my class or whatever. So, um, aiming for definitely at least eight hours a night. Um, and if I have to wake up early for training and I can only get six or seven hours, then trying to nap, 
during the day if, if I have time. Um, and that's, that is one of the big challenges um, of being kind of a full-time athlete and full-time student is that uh, my day is really, um, I'm, I'm kind of at the mercy of the number of hours in a day. And it's really hard to fit all my training, all my school, all my sleep, all my eating in, in, in 24 hours. Um, so that's when, when I really need to kind of be disciplined about getting to bed or, you know, not lounging around in between sessions or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I can definitely make it work. And then, uh, water is huge for me. I love drinking water. Um, I drink as much as I can. And when I look back at, um, kind of bad training sessions and stuff like that, there's a huge correlation between where I've been dehydrated and, uh, when I've had a bad session. So really important for me to stay on top of that. Cause you know, I'm sweating for six hours a day. So yeah. Right. Do you use any like wearables to track your data and recovery or anything like that? Um, if you're asking about like whoop or something like that, <laughs> I don't, um, we train, we train with a lot of data. Um, so I wear a heart rate monitor for most of my training. Um, and that is, partially used for measuring effort, but also it can be used for measuring fatigue and recovery on some of the EC sessions. And it also is really helpful in making sure I'm not going too hard on my EC days. So mm. we talk a lot in triathlon about making sure you're going easy on your easy days and hard on your hard days or going easy on your easy sessions and hard on your hard sessions. And, you know, we're all super motivated athletes sometimes it's hard for us to hold back on an easy session. We might be going too fast or something like that. And using that, di- using that data can actually help us make sure that we're not overdoing it. Um, but other than that, I, outside of training, I don't use any, any technology. Um, I'm just really uh, careful about listening to my body and I've been doing travel on for over half my life. So I've gotten used to, you know, knowing when I'm too tired to do a training session or when I need to push through or when I need to get some extra sleep or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's cool about using the the heart rate data on your easy days to kind of dictate your recovery. Would you do that to say, like, for example, you're going at the pace that you always do your easy days, but your heart rate is way higher than usual. Then you know that you're probably not recovered. Yeah. So we, we actually have, um, a certain heart rate protocol that we use on the bike. So we do it, we have a standardized form up and we measure the heart rate at two different points and we have a huge spreadsheet that we're tracking that in. So that's one way that really helps us measure fatigue. And if the heart rate is either really high or really low, both can be a sign of overtraining or under recovery. So we use that, but then also, like you mentioned on, on like an easy session, um, I, I will actually have heart rate um, kind of dictate the the pace. I will never just let my heart rate be higher than and, and stick to a certain pace. I would much rather let the let the heart rate dictate the pace. And so um, it's not like oh I'm running at my easy pace and my heart rate is 15 beats higher than it normally is. It's like I need to run a lot slower to make sure my heart rate is not that high. Hmm. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense there. I, I want to dive into, uh, like your entrepreneurship background, because I saw that, like, you know, we already talked about how much training you're doing and then with school. And then I saw that you, you had a landscaping company for many years, and then now you have a, a SaaS company in running training programs. Could you walk me through that? And then how you are even able to manage all these things? Yeah. So, so, um, with, with the landscaping company, I'll start with that. So I, uh, I was training a lot and it was kind of inconceivable for me to work like a a typical ship job or nine to five, because if you're, even if you're not training as much, if you're doing three sessions throughout the day, it, you don't want to pack them all in. You want to be able to spread them out throughout the day. And it makes it really difficult to be at work for eight hours or something like that. So I wanted to do something where I could make money, but still have it on my own schedule, do it when I wanted. And uh, I had a cousin who had done landscaping business. It was really lucrative for her. And um, I decided to give it a go. There's, I live uh, where my parents live is a little bit of an older demographic. So there are a lot of people who either couldn't do it or didn't want to, or were uninterested in doing their own landscaping. So, so yeah, I've been doing that for, for a few years now. And it was, 
hard, hard labor <laughs> in the summer and the heat, but you know, I guess maybe that's the one thing that the fitness did lean itself to. I was okay <laughs> dealing with that. Um, and so I'm kind of stepping away from that now and moving towards something that's a little uh, better for a high performance lifestyle. So not doing hard labor in the summer, um, which, which is Strident, which is uh, the company that you, you alluded to there. So this actually started as a school project in one of my courses last semester um, called New Venture Creation, where one of our projects was to actually, um, actually start a, a new company. And uh, we had like two months to make as much net income as possible. And um, afterwards, we had already done all the work and I decided that I would just pursue it. Um, I would just continue on after the course was done. So basically, the, the thought process is, is that with running or triathlon, um, for people who are just getting into the sport, it can be really overwhelming. They don't know how to train. And pretty much their two options are either to get a free online training program, which is not customized at all. And is pretty much just from a magazine or something like that, <laughs> yeah. or they could hire a coach, which is great and is preferred, but, um, is, can be pretty expensive, especially for a beginner who is not ready to put that much investment into their sport. So, um, what I did is I created a massive catalog of training programs that, could kind of act as customizable, um, but were already pre-made. So there are a bunch of different inputs and you kind of choose the one that lines up with your needs. So different durations, different race distances, um, different skill levels, different frequencies, and, and all that. Um, you kind of just search the catalog for the one that works exactly for what you're looking for. And so, yeah, I'm excited to see where that goes. I'm still in the early stages of it. Um, only a few customers so far, but, um, maybe once I graduate, I'll put a little more time into that and, and yeah, um, excited, hopefully trying to make some money so I can take some of the financial burden off of racing and I can just do it for the love of it. Yeah, that's so awesome. I'm, I'm a big fan of athletes becoming entrepreneurs and I did similar stuff. Um, trying to make the financial side work of, of pursuing sport, especially at the, the national level. Um, so I hope that that goes awesome. I think that's a really cool and a really cool business and a way to even just, you know, make some passive income that doesn't require too much of your time. So you can still focus on training. Is that, is that your, your plan basically to kind of use that as your way to support yourself when you're going all in on uh, triathlon training once you graduate in April? Yeah. So, so with triathlon, there's really, um, three ways in sport that you can make money. So there's the, the prize money and appearance fees from racing. Um, and then there's government funding for Olympic pathway athletes, which triathlon's an Olympic sport and I'm in the Olympic pathway. So I get access to some of that funding. And then there's also corporate sponsors and partners. So, um, those are the three main ways, three main ways that most athletes make a living in triathlon. Um, so, realizing that, you know, especially in a COVID year, um, you're really not making a lot of money from racing and, yeah. uh, and sponsorships are uh, dwindling, I'll say, yeah. um, you, I kind of wanted to make sure that if I was going to make this move to go all in on triathlon, I needed some sort of stability and especially seeing, you know, some of my classmates who are just recruiting for, for some of these business firms making, you know, six figures straight out of university. It's like, okay, it, it kind of motivates me to get it in gear and, and try to make something work for me. So. Yeah, that's awesome. And so uh, I don't want to go like past your, your triathlon career and say like, what do you want to do after that? But like, what's your interest if you weren't an athlete, would you, you know, just be all in on having a business or would you be like your classmates and um, trying to work for some of those firms? Yeah, I don't, I, I haven't put probably as much thought into this as some of my classmates because I didn't have to, but I think um, what I'm really interested in is kind of because of my background in both business and math, I'm really interested in the intersection between entrepreneurship and some sort of data or data analytics. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, not, not everyone in business school wants to be an entrepreneur, but I think that um, I would be the happiest if I was creating something myself. Um, I'm also really interested in strategy and operations. So maybe 
some form of consulting in that, or um, I really don't know yet. Um, I think I'll kind of wait uh, to see how some of my ventures go uh, <laughs> and, and maybe make a decision on that. But I think eventually uh, I'll be happiest if I'm to, if I'm running my own thing. That's awesome. I, I love it. Um, I have a couple questions I always like to ask at, at the end. Um, the first one is, what is one habit that you do every day, if you could only pick one, that is the biggest game changer in your life? Ooh, um, I would say this is, this is a cop-out answer <laughs> for traffic, but I would say going for a run is something that a lot of, is really scary for a lot of people, but I think um, it, it's almost meditative for me, especially mm-hmm. if you go in the morning, um, just being out there with your thoughts and, and having, you know, just some quiet time to yourself, especially right now we're, we're plugged in all the time with, with school being online and social media responsibilities as an athlete and all that. I know that every day I'll have at least, you know, an hour to myself on, on the trails. And, um, I, I know that, you know, the physical aspect of that can be intimidating for a lot of non-runners, but go as slow as you need to go and just enjoy that time with yourself and your thoughts. Hmm, I like that. Do you do any meditation or that is kind of your meditation? Yeah, I think eventually I I would love to, and I probably could make the time for it um, (laughs) if I really wanted to, but right now I'm just, I'd rather get the extra 30 minutes of sleep in the morning. Um, But, but like I said, we spend a lot of time training and when you're, when you're in the pool, just looking at the, the bottom of the pool, it is, you, you do sometimes kind of get into this trance and you get lost in your own thoughts. And that that's enough for me right now. Um, I, I do all my best thinking when I'm training. So, so yeah. I think that's a cool part about endurance sports. I was doing a lot of swimming in the fall um, when the gyms were closed, but pools were open. Uh, I think it was in the fall. And um, I found the same thing, like an hour in the pool. And especially then, sometimes I'd be the only person at the pool. For some reason, people weren't going. And yeah, you could just be with your thoughts. There's no music plugged in. There's nothing. And so I think that's cool because some sports, it's definitely not meditative. It's very intense, right? (laughs) Like you're playing football or something like that. But, you know, in your sport, you kind of are in that, that trance state or that flow state for, for a long time. Yeah. And that's been one of the benefits, I guess, of COVID is, uh, I normally train with a team year round and having a pretty much going to all solo training. Um, I definitely kind of wandered to a lot of introspective thoughts and I learned a lot about myself and kind of what I believe on certain things. And, and yeah, I think that everyone could benefit from a little more of uh, alone time. And, and I, I really do think that like insurance sport can be, you know, transformative for some people if they have the right mindset. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Last uh, for me running though, <laughs> I, it's hard for me to get into that state with running. <laughs> I'm gonna It my, my heart rate is like, I'll be walking and I'm like, this is, it's too high. I have to stop. <laughs> Well, there we go. To go for a walk then. That's just as good. That's true. I do do that. You know, having a dog makes it pretty easy for the, for the daily walks. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. So this last question has evolved. So anyone, uh, anyone who is listening to the podcast, you'll see that I've been trying to change this question up over the past few weeks. And I think maybe, hopefully I've landed on the right way to ask it. It used to be, I used to ask people if they're looking back from their deathbed, what would they want their legacy to be? And then it kind of, I got challenged by a guest on that. And so now I'm changing it to, you're looking back on your life. Let's say you're 150. We have Elon Musk, brain link, whatever. <laughs> and uh, you're looking back and what impact did you want to have made? Um, for me, I think that really when I think about what, uh, what I want my purpose in life to be, it, it's really simple. I want to be happy and I want to make everyone else around me happy. And, um, the triathlon community has given me a lot, um, in terms of support. Um, you know, a lot of older athletes have been there for me and I want to do my best to pay that forward to the younger generation and learning the lessons that I've learned the hard way. I think that a lot of people can learn slightly easier way and, and bringing, you know, the positive energy that I can bring and kind of spreading that to the people I'm training with and the people in the community. Um, yeah, I, I think that just, uh, I don't necessarily want my impact to be 
with just my results or my sports resume, I think that if that's all the impact I've had, then I've probably failed as a person inside my sports community. So I think it's just about um, kind of being there for the next generation and bringing positivity wherever I go. Mm, I love that. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for being on. Where can people find you so they can follow your journey? Yeah, so um, probably the easiest way would be on Instagram uh, at Liam Donnelly23. Um, I've just started a TikTok for the past two months and people <laughs> love seeing videos of my training. So that's Liam Donnelly Try. Um, and then, yeah, if you want to connect with me like more professionally, I'm a good business student. So I'm on LinkedIn <laughs> um, at Liam Donnelly. And, and yeah, those would be probably the three, three main ones. Awesome. Well, appreciate you coming on, especially in the midst of all the training that you do um, to take this hour and share some of your training and your mindset with us. So thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Natalie.